and welcome to episode number 188 of the LSR podcast. My name is Matt Brown, joined each and every week by the brightest minds in all the gaming industry. With me, I have two of those, one of which is Dustin Galker. You can follow him on the Twitter machine at Dustin Galker. The other is Adam Candy. You can follow him on the Twitter machine at Adam Candy. That is two E's, no Y. And if you hate yourself, you can follow me at Matt Brown M2. We do appreciate every single subscription, every single rating, every single review. Absolutely free. Everything we do, absolutely free. So your way of helping us, absolutely free as well. Going to talk some legislative things to close things out. We'll talk about Flutter. We'll do some stuff with what's going on with the AGA and maybe some of the college college stuff that's going on out there as well. But uh, Adam, let's kick things off here. And this was something that was, uh, you know, we were getting some NFL meetings stuff coming out. We know people, deb- where's Odell Beckham going to end up? Are we going to be able to review, you know, roughing the passer, all the different things? But uh, some other stuff has also come out of the NFL owners meetings as well. Well, what we're going to talk about here is sort of a secondary thing <clears throat> from the NFL owners meetings. And the primary thing is that the number zero, which is yes. actually not a number, but zero is allowed, but it's not allowed on defensive linemen. And the fact that we're not going to get a Vita Vea zero is so disappointing to me. But I guess that's not the only thing that happened at the NFL owners meetings this week. Uh, Related to our little corner of the world, the NFL owners voted to allow stadiums in sports books to accept bets on game day. And you probably think to yourself, all right, well, if you were going to have a book in a stadium wouldn't you think it would be allowed to take bets on game day but that needed to be clarified in the rules for the nfl now currently that only applies to the washington football team and yes i'm sticking with the washington football team because it's better than the commanders Mm -hmm. the washington football team has a book that it opened in january in fedex field and as you know they don't play a lot of football uh in fedex field in january these days Sorry, Dustin and I are both from the NFC East, so like, I got to just get my Washington shots in while I can. Um, and so there are three other teams that have stadiums outside of, I should say, sports books outside of the stadium. You have uh, the sports book for BetMGM at uh, State Farm Stadium in Glendale, and then you also have the Jets and Giants having the Meadowlands uh, book right on property there with FanDuel, just not actually inside MetLife Stadium. Now, It brings up a whole host of other issues that I think we could talk about when it comes to this, which is, of course, yes, you want the game day sportsbook experience in stadium to be worth something to ownership. But at the same time, we're talking about the need for mobile betting to be widely adopted. And we have 18 stadiums in which that is a possibility here these days with mobile betting in the NFL. And so what we're looking at here to me is a couple of things. First of all, what truly is the value of retail? We've had that discussion, I believe, about a month ago in terms of, you know, where retail in stadium in particular fits back into uh, the overall equation these days. But also, I think we're going to start to get into questions when it comes to in play and being able to bet in the stadium versus being able to bet outside of the stadium versus being able to bet on TV, right, where there's a significant delay uh, in the in-play betting experience versus those who are in the stadium might actually have a fairly significant advantage when it comes to in-play if they choose to bet that way and what effect might that have in the long haul. So it's interesting. I think this piece of news ultimately raises as many questions as the news itself answers. Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up, and that was what I was going to to follow up with with Dustin, is as we know, one of the things that is the problem, and I say problem in air quotes, I know that they are working on certain things to help, and really it's the, we're, we're slaves to the cell service and how fast our cell service is and different things like that, and of course, also, if you're watching a game streaming or something like that, there's going to be latency when it comes down to all of that, but there is a distinct, there actually really is a distinct advantage to being inside the stadium as comparative to the rest of the people, rest of country, because, you know, a lot of times these odds are changing and the play has already happened. And you don't really realize that unless you are a super savvy gambler, because that's one of those things that just kind of, you learn along the way that there are a player two ahead of you a lot of times whenever you're betting live. But if you're actually inside the stadium, it's impossible for that to be the case. And so if these odds are actually updating, um, you know, in real time, 
then you do actually find yourself at an advantage being inside the stadium comparatively to a person who's just, you know, somewhere else outside watching on television. I mean, it also just underlines that it's a like, who cares? Cause you could already bet online in football stadiums, right? This is not, this is not new. Yeah. <laughs> you could, you could, you could, you could, uh, if your state legalized it, you could place a bet at any game that uh, recently uh, in any of these places that have legalized sports betting and of an NFL team. So that's, yeah, I mean, there's, there's that it certainly is, you know, you have, you, you know, it'll be interesting to see if we get more adoption of people betting uh, there. You know, I, I, I don't know what the take up is of somebody sitting in a sports book and watching. Certainly if you're going to the game, you want to place a bet prior to the game. That's, that's sort of interesting, but I mean, it is like more of the interest of this is, like oh, having uh, the, a use for the stadium on the day on the hundreds and hundreds of days when it's not be u- being used, that you know the, the game day uh, uh, option is kind of I don't know, it felt sort of irrelevant to me. Like 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 Adam said, we are we've already crossed this bridge. We have sports books in stadiums, uh, not just the NFL. You know this is this is coming a lot of places. We have had the leagues, per, you know, come out and say we want to be the licensing vehicle for for sports betting. So this. Like it's just a you know it's a it's it's actually kind of minor in my mind that like we've the 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 NFL and all these teams and leagues have already crossed this bridge and to like make a little bit of a difference for oh we're open on game day now I mean good because you're there's no, there's not really any difference you've already put a sports book next to your team and in the stadium um, when you you know for for decades you uh, oppose sports betting like this is just you know really you know from that standpoint normalizing it it, it, it is interesting in the in the wake of this, uh, this we don't think we've we're going to get into this particularly but Bradley Beal and the story about the wizards and the uh, and the the, uh, the Orlando Magic and a better calling him out that he lost a bet like that that's this is maybe a little bit more dangerous like when we talk about Oh, we're now having bets here, and fans are not going to be happy if their players place. This is what leagues have said. Like at least I don't know the NHL has has decried, and like you're you're putting that right in front of the players. Then like it's a it's a little bit different from that optic standpoint. Uh, again, I think uh, it's the only part that it maybe is a little bit of of wishy washiness out of this. That yeah, now you have oh you're taking a bet, then you can watch the players right in front of them. Uh, you know, NFL stadium, you don't have a whole lot of access to players, but. It is an interesting discussion, that part of it, uh, as leagues try to, to open up uh, and get more and more into sports betting. And, you know, the end state probably is that they want to be the ones taking the bets themselves. I mean, that may not be tomorrow, but it's it's probably something that they're they're looking at down the road. And Adam, frankly, I mean, at the end of the day, if you're if you're one of these sports books, I mean, this is the bang for the buck, right? I mean, like this is the whole reason you did it in the first place. I mean, you have the captive audience, you have the people, the way to expose your brand to the most amount of people who might be prone to, you know, making a bet with you and getting exposed to your brand. And maybe you figure out a way at the counter to get them to download the app, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like this is what they're paying for. Like this is, this is the bang for the buck in these sponsorship deals. Yeah, and I think what it's going to lead to is a lot of speculation about who will now consider this option that might not have considered the option Mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, Is a mobile sponsorship deal going to be sufficient for you if you're an NFL team dealing with a sports book, or do you want to put that retail into the actual stadium? And I mean that from both sides of the partnership. You know, what does the sports book want to do? They want the build out cost of doing some sort of lounge or what an actual sports book do they want to actually have to go through the uh, the setup of putting an actual operation in the in the stadium what sort of operation will you have in the stadium if that's the case are, are we talking about something where you know we've got what a $500 limit on hand or are we going to be handling cash at, at this sports book there are all sorts of questions when you talk about this environment of having a book in the stadium that I think will be interesting for those of us in the industry to keep an eye on because you know at the end of the day Dustin that is where the impulse buys happen right I mean like that is where you're you're going like you're no no one on the face no no one on the face of the planet has ever been sitting there on a random Wednesday and be like you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna go buy a giant foam finger like that's you know what I'm just I can't I I just can't get by get through today without buying them but you're in the stadium and you'll friggin pull the trigger on a foam finger and all this so it's kind of like you know even from a betting aspect like that's where you're going to get kind of you know 
the impulse bets. It's like, oh, you know what? I'm here. I'm, I want to feel a little bit more in this game. I want a little bit something going on. So, I mean, again, it's just, it's from the book standpoint as well. I do think that this is a, a pretty big deal, actually, just from a, hey, there is still a barrier to having to download an app and fund an app and do a lot of things like that. And there isn't one to just walk up to a counter handing, you know, 20 bucks over and then getting a ticket in your hand. I'm curious uh, for the the sports book for the Washington football team, if they're going to have more liability on betting against their team, because (laughs) apparently people in Washington hate the, hate the franchise. Now I think I saw a survey about that, that uh, not very popular in the Washington area area. I'm I'm shocked at that as uh, what a debacle of a franchise that is. But uh, yeah, I mean, you get, you got people coming in. Yeah. Again, you, you are open like pregame. Like, what are you doing? If you're not tailgating, like, Oh, maybe I'll go place a bet. Like it's uh, it's certainly the type of engagement that I think sports leagues uh, envisioned when, when they, when they uh, started getting into all the sports betting stuff. So here we are when we knew that there was going to be some evolution to all of this. Right. I mean, I know that we have been in this for so incredibly long that it feels like this has been around forever, but this is still the infancy of all of this here in the United States. And so we figured that there would be some sort of amendments to things along the way. And Dustin, that is kind of what we are looking at right now. Yeah. American gaming association back in 2019, put a responsible marketing code out there for, for its members uh, around sports betting. Um, Obviously 2019, very early days for the expansion of all this came back here now just this week and said, here's what, here's what we're changing. And I'll be curious what Adam thinks it's, it's not like, game changing stuff but it is worth saying all this stuff out loud i think and putting it into a code people will say oh they didn't go far enough but what I, I'm, I'm here to tell you at least they're saying it right this nobody else is saying this on behalf of the industry so it's good that they're at least coming out here and saying you know th- very basic things that we've been talking about on this podcast but saying it stop using risk-free uh formalizing uh, a process for reviewing this every year make sure it's keeping up not, not having nil deals for amateur and college athletes letting uh you know stopping uh, basically college partnerships to promote them to, to college campus making sure it's over 21 like again seems like very basic stuff but when nobody has said all of this together in one cohesive way out loud so it's it's good that we're doing maybe it didn't go far enough but you know the aga represents a diverse membership and uh you know at least we should be at least we're going down the road of hey we're trying to do something and as an industry saying here we're going to do these things that again, have really changed really quickly in the last past few months. And uh, also take it, take, let's look at this all the time and let, not just say, oh, this thing in 2019 works in, in 2025 or 26. We're going to start looking at, the, at this more. So um, I, I'm saying it's good because, yeah, we, we have the, we've kind of lost the narrative on the, in the sports betting industry about all this. AGA is at least saying, hey, we're not going to do these things as an industry. And that's interesting. Yeah, Adam, this is one of the things that we talked about whenever it got announced. We were saying it was just kind of a slippery slippery slope to begin with, right? I mean, listen, I've been to Tiger Stadium. LSU is one of the schools that's going to have to end their relationship with Caesar Sportsbook. I've been to uh, Tiger Stadium. The majority of the advertising is found in the suite area, right? Like the expensive area where you assume that, I mean, again, but that's the problem. It's like, it's assumptions. You assume that it's going to be, you know, 95% adults because again, it's their super expensive seats and like, you know, everything like that. But it, it's, it's just, we always talk about just the optics of things and how things are just like, if you allow this, well, are you going to allow this? And does that lead to this and whatever? And so I, I'm glad the AGA actually came out and said this, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, Caesars and whoever else, I know there's a handful of schools that have had these deals done. They're, they're going to find ways to market to the collegiate football fan without having to put it right dead center in the middle of the stadium few things that I think are important to keep in mind when it comes to this. First of all, not all sports betting operators in the United States are part of the AGA. And so those who are not part of the AGA probably aren't going to have to play by these rules for the purposes of uh, being in good standing with that organization. Uh, You can look in our story on LegalSportsReport.com where we have it listed out as to which operators are members of the American Gaming Association. Now you talk about those college partnerships. There were carve outs within the rules that the AGA changed in which if it's a responsible gambling message or if you are pitching to the alumni network of a college, then those are things that are are still allowed under that code. I think it's also really important to keep in mind how this came about. This really goes back to one state, Ohio, Bucking up, getting a spine on this and saying, you know what you can't do? You can't use risk-free or free bets. 
that is the genesis of all of this. And how quickly has it all happened? We're talking about the better part of three months for this sort of change to have happened in multiple states. And now with the trade group that represents the entire industry. And I think what it goes to show is that if the industry chooses to self-regulate, and when I say the industry, I'm counting regulators as part of the industry. Everyone who has an interest in this being done in a responsible way that is sustainable for the long haul, then if it can be done in a way that is self-regulating by the industry, it just goes to show the fact that it is possible for this industry to make better choices without being hit over the head with a hammer from state legislators, from the federal government. It can be done. It just takes a will, and it takes a collective willingness to play along if someone says, you got to do this, right? Could the operators have tried to fight this harder in Ohio? Sure, they could have, but they didn't. And now it's going to be something that is pretty much standard practice throughout a lot of places in the United States. And Dustin, really, at the end of the day with all of this, it, it just comes down to what we've said before. It's like, it's just better to get ahead of all of this stuff than to let something happen to where you have to go back and try and fix things. And whatever. Like It's just good to go ahead and get ahead of all of this stuff. And so when you see, see, th see things like this, while we do believe that there are other steps that could be taken and other things that could be done, I mean, listen, it's still a it's still a positive for the industry as a whole because we don't want to be playing catch up. We should always be trying to look ahead. Yeah, and again, it's codifying what Adam just said is that these things are started to happen in the self-regulatory or just because Ohio mm -hmm. regulated it. And then it's become de facto the standard across the country. And like, again, it's worth it to stay. We're going to do this here. And, uh, you know, everybody who's a member of the AJ is going to now be beholden to this. This is what we expect of our, our membership. It's that's that's good messaging. It's again uh, taking control of a narrative that has has escaped us. Uh, I think as an industry in recent months. So it's uh, from that standpoint really good. Adam, we talked about uh, you know we'll, we'll be talking a lot about Texas and what may or may not be going on with Texas. But of course, California was the big thing that we had our eye on last year, and this is a state in which there were you know as we as we talked about some some very crazy ad campaigns that are being run and a ridiculous amount of money that was being spent to either try and get this passed or to try and get it not to get passed. And so there are some people who are starting to talk about California yet again, but not necessarily about anything getting done anytime soon. To go back to what you said at the beginning there, uh, the hearings have begun in Texas. So at least in terms of the things that are coming this year, uh, in terms of possibilities, that is on the way now, not a lot of note happening there quite yet. In terms of California, as you just mentioned, uh, an interview that Jason Robbins, the CEO of DraftKings, did with Joe Pompliano talking about the future of California sounded a very different tone than what we heard directly after the election from not only DraftKings, but FanDuel as well. And I want to give the quote exactly here from Jason Robbins so that we uh, so that we represent this accurately. And we know that it's a situation where it, these words really do matter in terms of understanding what the intent is. Quote, the fact is, if someone wants to spend that much in opposition, it makes it tough. So until we figure out a way to work that out, I don't think it's a 2024 thing in terms of California sports betting. I think I'm talking long term when I think eventually it doesn't matter what someone wants to spend. It's just self-evident that this is something California should be doing, but that's not in the next year or two. I think there's got to be a deal worked out or else we're just going to be in a stalemate there for at least another cycle or two. And the other interesting part of this quote, as he went on during the interview, was there were there were more statements about how difficult it is when you have an opponent who's willing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in opposition. Okay, a couple things here. First of all, right after the election, both Jason Robbins and Amy Howe from FanDuel made it sound like we'll be back to fight another day. We'll take another shot in 2024. I don't know that that sounds like the dynamic from what we're hearing now. Uh, secondly, did you not know before the election that you were going to have hundreds of millions of dollars spent in opposition? Like The tribal gaming interests were not shy about this. They were very clear right up front that we will spend whatever we have to to make sure that our interests are represented and that if there's going to be online sports betting in California, which we don't know if there ever will be, but if it happens, that it's going to be done in a way that befits the tribes. 
And that to me seems like a miscalculation on the part of all of the sports books who took part in this initiative to try to legalize sports betting, because not only did you have that money spent in opposition, but they did a terrible job of trying to convince people that this is something that should be in their interest. So when you talk about it should be self-evident, well, if you want it to be self-evident, then don't couch it inside this idea of we're going to benefit homelessness to the point where a lot of people in California had absolutely no idea that the initiative was about sports betting. You went about it in a way that suggested you were not proud of it, that suggested you were not being transparent in that sports betting as an activity should be legal and regulated for reasons beyond tax revenue to the state, but obviously because of that as well, but because of the responsible gambling elements of it, because of the fact that in California especially, there is such a massive market that is not being captured here that could benefit the state that is dealing with all sorts of budget problems. So I, I think it's good that there's reflection within the industry as to what went wrong and what didn't go well. I just hope there's acceptance of the way that it happened the first time so that whenever they try again, it can be a more coherent effort in terms of presenting to people why they think online sports betting should be legalized. Yeah, Dustin, I think the industry as a whole just basically got some really bad advice by whoever was kind of manning this push in California in a couple of different angles. I mean, one Adam just mentioned, right, was trying to get it passed, like not just like, hey, you know, here's a personal freedom. This is why it should be passed or whatever, as opposed to like trying to attach it to this whole homeless thing and all this stuff like that. Like, obviously we were very against that from the get go here on the podcast. But anyway, like that was, this isn't something that like, you know, all of the sports books got together and, and invented, like someone pitched this to them and they were like, Oh, you think this is how this gets done? And they're like, yeah, this is how it gets done. Like, like th this, this is like someone pitched this to them and they got like almost, almost sold a bill of, of goods and all of this. And I think that maybe someone also sold them on the fact that, that the interest would be much, much higher within the state, even with the tribes going to putting up this massive amount of opposition. I mean, you and I, I guess, have a little bit more intimate knowledge for this because we know how much they went after keeping online poker out of California. Like it was crazy how much they went after keeping online poker out of California uh, whenever that was the, the big push over there and all that. So it just seems like more than anything, maybe the whole industry kind of got got fed some bad information and got like really sold something that was never really, you know, there. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's all hubris at this point, right? It's, this is what happened. This is like, there's a book to be written about the amazing lobbying effort that happened across the United States. The fact that we took basically three years, they were go like uh, the sports books and the leagues were going around getting bills passed wherever they wanted. Right. They're just like wins everywhere. Like they may lost some too, but it was, there's, it's hard to go like point to too many lobbying efforts on a multi-state basis that are as successful as legalizing sports betting. So they probably went to California, you got the leagues on board. You're like, oh, we're going to just come in here and spend a lot of money, get this bill passed. Maybe don't, maybe we don't, we don't, we, we don't get it this year, but we'll set up the state for the next time and really get people like this will, this will happen. And yeah, again, you could listen to this podcast for free advice. Cause I'm like, we might've been more bullish on it uh, at the beginning just because well, things sounded good, but like, we, we could all told you, this is not just coming in here and do the same thing that you did, run the playbook you did everywhere else. It just was never going to work. And it's and now it's to the point where they made it worse than the starting point. Like it, it is the situation in California because of this lobbying effort uh, is is worse than what it was when we started. Like we, we, if you go back in time and just not even try, we'd have a better shot in 2024 pr pretty clearly at this point than we do right now. So it is, yeah, it's amazing in, in, in retrospect that like they just said, oh, we're, I think they just thought they were just going to like, just like they did everywhere else. We're going to, we're going to run over everyone and, and just win and get this, get this, you know, again, maybe not get it all the way, but get it close enough that we, we can get another chance at it at a future ballot. And, you know, it's uh, that, that, that part of the book that, again, I think somebody will read a, write a book just on lobbying, uh, whether it's sports betting or not. This is an amazing, the whole thing is interesting and fascinating to me, but the fact that this, you know, after all these wins, just a you know colossal failure in, in California will kind of haunt this industry, I think, for for the next couple of years. Adam, I've had a couple of people ask me, you know, like, I mean, how how could how could it gotten to a point, you know, not just in Florida, but in California as well, where these tribes hold so much power in like, you know, basically the will of what they want gets done and things like that. And I'm like, well, I mean, that's kind of a a question, a topic for another day, but the tooth, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, right? I mean, like they, they have that much power, what they say basically goes when it comes to the gaming industry. So it's kind of like, you know, is it fair that you basically have to do everything on their terms? 
again, argument for another day, but it's kind of like that's how it's going to have to go if we realistically think anything's going to get done in the next, I don't know, decade, let's call it. Because, I mean, unless something gets happen- unless something happens on a federal level, which we don't think is going to happen, it's going to basically have to run through the tribes whether you like it or not. Fairness is an interesting way to go about this when we talk about why tribes have been allowed to have gaming historically going back hundreds and hundreds of years. So I I think that could be maybe the wrong tack for someone to take with this if that's the way they want to approach how business gets done in California. The reality of it is it is a multi-billion dollar business for gaming tribes in California alone. And that is a powerful, powerful interest that you talk about not putting the toothpaste uh, back into the tube. You're 100% right. That's not going to happen anywhere in California. The reality is that tribal sway over gaming in California is as strong as it is, if not stronger, than it is in any other state. And so if you try to look forward to how this goes, you have to then look backward and say, 16% of people voted in favor of Prop 27, the operator's online initiative. Realize how difficult it is to get 84% of people in the year 2022 and now 2023 to agree on anything. And 84% of people who voted in California in 2022 said, no, we don't want this. That has to be something that is a reckoning. Dustin said you would be better off had this never gone to the ballot. You're absolutely right. That set this effort back a minimum of two years and probably more realistically half a decade unless the industry wants to come hat in hand 100% to the tribes and say whatever you want it to be is what it'll be. And keep in mind, even if they were to do that, Tribes have been very clear about the fact that they don't necessarily want online sports betting, period. They don't have the same interests as the industry. They want people to go to their properties, and they don't see the opening up of online gaming in any form as a good thing for their long-term prospects because in the end, this was all about online gaming for the tribes and them not wanting any of the operators to have an in to potentially start offering iGaming, which is where they really believe that their interests will be affected. Dustin, one of the things I, D- Dustin, real quick, one of the things I love to do to you is is put you a- at an over-under. And like, hopefully this podcast will still be running at the time that whatever date that you set on this, that we will actually have sports betting in the state of California. But if I had to set an over-under right now, what year would you do this? Man, I'm not even sure I'm putting this on the board. It's, it's, <laughs> it's that bad. Like, I don't know. I like I could envision 2029, I guess. Yeah, right. Like that's, but even that sounds optimistic to me. Again, with the starting point, we, unless we have this conversation, this real conversation of the operator, uh, operators and the leads come hat, hat in hand to the, to the tribe and say, here's what we want to do. And we like want to help you and like do this in the best way for you. Is that going to happen? I don't know. I don't think so. Because again, they think long term. They're still going to win. Um, again, the leagues, their their interest in all of this is they thought, you know, going back way in history, they thought they'd have, you know, when Adam Silver was saying nice things about sports betting, we need we need to legalize and things. They thought they were going to own it. They thought they had a, a infinity time to own this and just to, to run to figure out how it was going to be regulated in the United States. And then pass by, fell, and then they just lost the argument entirely. So uh, it'll be interesting to see um what's going on uh, in all of this long term but i'll also say one other thing like tribes get a lot of uh, talk uh, at least on twitter and, and just in the industry that they're obstructionists they're not obstructionists they are looking out for their best interest there is nothing go- good going on for native american tribes really right now other than gaming they they deserve to to continue to win this argument as long as they want to they should get whatever they want on this i, I don't i you know I, I used to think maybe they should be a little bit they should relent and like at least have it through them they can do whatever they want. This is their this is their game, right? In in California and, and some other places, they're they're not being obstructionist in any way. Yes, technically they're being obstructionist, but I don't begrudge them at all for not believing what governments are trying to sell them or anybody is trying to sell them on sports betting. Adam, I guess to 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 put a bow on this, like I wonder if we get to a point now. We understand California is certainly like the golden goose. It's got a population the size of Canada, but. 
you know, if we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, right. And we're, and we're, and we're talking about like, Hey, this could, this could by the, you know, if it keeps failing over and over and over again, we could be looking, looking back on this a decade later and be like, wow, we lit 500 and 600 million dollars on fire doing this. Like, I don't know if it's out of the realm of possibility for California to just get tabled for several years. Right. I mean, like it, you just focus on the entire rest of the country. You focus on getting Texas done. You focus on somehow trying to figure out something in Florida, whatever it might be. You've got the rest of the country and where California, even though you really, or even though you really want it, you're probably saying, mm, is the juice really worth the squeeze here? Because the likelihood of it actually getting done to the cost and what we might end up just lighting on fire might not be actually where it is. Well, we're going to start to get into total addressable market dynamics here and also shareholder interests and growth uh, potential and a lot of questions for those publicly traded companies about how do they continue to show their investors a reason to put money into them when they have been chasing profitability for quite a long time here and some of them are only talking about getting there later this year, if not uh, into 2024. So now you look at California, you look at Texas, you look at Florida and say, where are your probabilities? Well, if you think tribal interests are strong in California, go ahead and take a look at Florida, where one tribe basically controls everything uh, when it comes to sports betting in Florida. And you were looking at under the structure that was going to be there prior to this ending up in federal court you were looking at operators having to pay something in the range of 40% of a revenue share back to the tribes just to be able to participate in the first place. And that was going to be a non-starter for them. And so now you start to look at Texas. And when you look at Texas, you see more hope than you do in the other places, but it's sort of in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king because it is just a matter of relative hope in Texas. It is still a significant underdog for sports betting to get passed in this legislative session in Texas. And if it doesn't get passed in 2023, we know they only meet in opposite years. And so you're looking at 2025 before anything becomes a real possibility. And if something were to happen in Texas this year, it still has to go to the ballot and win a fight there. So I don't think they can afford to give up on California from the perspective of continuing to tell their investors a story about how these companies grow when you have FanDuel and DraftKings in particular dominating this market, if you're MGM, if you're Caesars who chose not to play in California because of competing interests there, uh, it's going to at least force questions about, okay, if it's not California, if it's not Texas or Florida, then how do you continue to show growth unless you are going to take over another operator or somehow bank on being able to pick up the minuscule market share that some of these smaller operators eventually are going to lose if they have to either sell or if they just go out of business entirely. And I don't know if you're MGM or Caesars sitting around saying we're going to wait to pick up the scraps from Barstool and you know, points bet is going to be convincing enough to your shareholders to continue to make these massive investments in sports betting. Yeah, Dustin, the the one thing I, I do wonder, and then we'll move on to our, our, our next topic here, which uh, you will man for us. But I, I do wonder, though, it's like, you know, do you look back on this and say hundreds of millions of dollars over the course of, let's call it five years of trying to get something done in California? Or do we take that money and invest it into iGaming lobbying efforts in states that we're already in with sports betting, like which we know is incredibly lucrative and things like that? Like, do you do you basically just get to a point where you shift those funds to just another effort that might actually make people, you know, get excited about something. Yeah. I mean, after this cycle of legislation, like the, the map doesn't look great for, for sports betting. Mm -hmm. I think all of this, I think all the lobbying needs to go in online casino and for, mm -hmm. and poker right now. Like that's the growth, the growth story. And it's, it's been slow to happen. Um, but once we get through Texas, we're gonna have two years, uh, you know, whether if it passes great, if it doesn't, then we're gonna have two years in Texas. We have a, like, basically a handful of States that could legalize, um, you should be going to iGaming. That's, you know, all these companies, uh, you know, have, are, they're, they're focused on this as their future. Uh, you, like ticking off a few wins here and there for sports betting, not as great as, as focusing on and, and driving this narrative for online casino that, we, you know, it's still this uphill battle. We know every, you know, I, I remember people say Michigan passed, then we're just going to have this onslaught of online casino. Nope, not going to happen. It's, this is continue. Nobody's winning that narrative uh, and continue, we continue to hear that sports betting, 
you know, it, you know, it's getting some of this pushback, but it's it's really this this huge pace of of legalization, and online casino has gotten benefited almost not at all from that that tailwind of sports betting and online sports betting being legalized. So that's where I would be putting all the money. I'd stop I'd stop worrying about California and Florida and and even Texas after this election cycle, and and be you know going into smaller state houses and working on where you've already passed online sports betting and and drive the casino uh, discussion forward. All right, so we talk a lot about Flutter on here. It is the parent company, of course, to FanDuel, if you have not been paying attention. And we have also talked a lot about stonks. We are not, hashtag disclosure, all the things like that. We are not stonk experts, so do not take any of our financial advice here on any things like that. But uh, we did talk a lot about the fact that you could invest in basically all of the big companies that we talk about here on this podcast, except for Flutter, because they were only listed overseas. But that might be coming to an end here, Dustin. Yeah, uh, positive notes out of Flutter about the possibility of a secondary listing here in the United States. They apparently have polled shareholders uh, back in February, and then just last week they announced that um, they've consulted widely with shareholders, representing a majority of Flutter's issued share capital, and received very strong support, which is uh, good news. They need 75% of shareholders to uh, to agree to uh, a U.S. listing here for, for Flutter. Uh, and obviously with all of the business a lot of the business at Flutter now coming from Fandle and its U.S. operations. This is a, this is a big deal. Uh, interesting st- from the the story done by Matt Waters at LSR. Here's the most interesting, and here's why: Fandle, uh, Flutter tra- average value volume seven hundred thousand shares. DraftKings listed in the United States thirteen point five million daily average volume. That they want that access to to North American capital, and that's the, you know the story here. And again, like if you're you're the leader in the in the U.S. in the U.S., you don't really get that. Uh, that benefit from uh, trading in in, the Euro- in Europe and seeing this U.S. listing, I think you know, will will give them great access to capital and uh, you know uh, help their growth story here in the United States, which is uh, I'd say concerning for for everyone else uh, in the sports betting and online casino industry here in the U.S. Adam, we uh, used to end every single podcast with you giving us state roundups, and then those states kept getting legalized and things would just get done. And then we got to a point where we didn't have any state roundups anymore, but guess what? We got a little bit of a legislative roundup to take us home here today. I'm actually going to do this one off the top of my head because (laughs) we have been so deep into this that I have a pretty strong sense of what's happening in all of these states without even (laughs) rereading any of the stories that we posted at legal sports report. And uh, that is something that goes uh, with a big shout out to Pat Evans uh, Matthew Waters to uh, Sam McQuillan, uh, as well as Mike Mazio, who have been uh, watching all of these hearings sometimes late into the night. All right, let's start where it appears there is the strongest possibility of legalization of online in the short term, and that is down in North Carolina, where the bill that we expected might have a chance, but it stalled out last year in the House, uh, actually looks like it needs one more vote to get out of the house and to get to the desk of the governor. And in that case, you would add online sports betting to the couple of tribal casinos that have retail sports betting in California. Uh, It's a bill that looked like it had some hope last year before stalling out. There were some questions around uh, banning college sports and amendment to that failed yesterday. And it looks like with all of the amendments yesterday having been voted down, and most of those would have been restrictive on sports betting, it looks like that is moving toward the possibility of passing, and we don't know when that would actually legalize, but uh, passing in the spring, we've seen in the past, states like Arizona uh, has led to launching in the fall, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. There's also unexpected hope in Kentucky, where if you've been following this podcast, you've heard us talk about the possibility of sports betting in Kentucky for the absolute longest of times. Representative Adam Koenig had been at the front of this. And the sort of strange irony is that uh, Koenig no longer in the legislature, but it looks like his work has a chance of moving forward here. We had a bill pass the House in Kentucky, but that's not really the news. Our Pat Evans has been staying really close to this story and heard from the bill sponsor in the House that even though because it's an odd year, the threshold is two thirds for a vote in the Senate as opposed to a simple majority in even years, it looks like they might have the votes to get this by the Senate. That's at least the informal whip count that they've been doing. If it is to get through, you have another governor who has been public in his support of legalizing sports betting. 
Kentucky could be another state that gets through this year. You go up to Minnesota, you have multiple bills that are winding their ways through committee, but it has been largely favorable feedback in Minnesota to this point. It's a state that, again, another one Pat Evans has been watching, that he put at the top of his rankings in terms of where he felt states were most likely to legalize at the beginning of the year. We also have Georgia still in the mix here. Um, it's not hopeful at this point. It looked like it was dead earlier in the session, and then there was this sort of hostile takeover of a soapbox derby bill that uh, came out of committee that had sports betting language inserted after the bill had been stripped. It made a lot of folks upset in that committee, and there was some discussion about whether this was potentially going to set back sports betting in Georgia uh, through the uh, lieutenant governor having kind of pushed to keep it alive. We'll see what happens there. Not as hopeful as in other states, uh, but Georgia is still technically alive through the rest of this week. As we mentioned earlier, we're keeping eyes on Texas. Nothing really new there to report, but of course, we'll keep talking to you about what's happening there. But we're, we are looking at three states that have possibility of getting something through this year. As longtime listeners know, that doesn't mean it's actually going to happen, but it is more than I think we might have thought at the beginning of this year might be possibilities. So, Adam, I mean, I can we, we already have it, right? I mean, we already know it. They're going to be betting on soapbox derbies and whatever and all like we can already hear it right now. We know exactly how this is going to go. I mean, like we're we've got the bulletin board material already. Oh, listen, we already this week have had talk along the lines of legalizing sports betting is what is going to bring in the drug dealers and the prostitutes. Yeah, that has happened yeah. in a legislature this past week. And so if you had that on your bingo guess, card, go ahead and, you know, scratch, scratch, scratch that one off. Listen, we, we've had it compared. <laughs> We've had it compared to murder. Uh, we've had it compared to slavery. Uh, it really, it has been a cornucopia of bad ideas that have been uh, ascribed to sports betting that uh, are worth a good laugh. As we say each and every week, all of the stories we talk about here, you can find over at LegalSportsReport.com. So please go in and take in all of the words that Adam and company are putting on the site over there. We do appreciate every bit of your free support here. So if you go down, subscribe, rate, review, all the different things that you can do like that. And if you're watching us on the video side of things on the YouTube button as well, hit that subscribe and do appreciate appreciate the support over there as well if you want to follow adam at adam candy no uh two e's no y at dustin galker if you'd like to follow dustin on the twitter machine for adam for dustin i'm matt talk to you guys next week